Welcome underground in Northern Ontario, far underground, to where it is dark, dirty, sometimes dangerous, and definitely not where most of us would choose to spend our days. Even if you have never been underground at an operating mine, you likely have some reasonable idea about what it might be like to work in such an environment. However, no matter what your own perception may be, what it is like to work at a mine has been changing at a rapid pace over the last decade or so. Mining, a fundamental contributor to our Canadian economy, has been undergoing a transformation. Away from public eyes, robots are being deployed. Intelligent mobile robots. Autonomous vehicles, capable of carrying loads of valuable ore from underground to surface where it can be processed and turned into the metals and materials that we all depend on to carry out our modern lives including all of our everyday digital devices and infrastructure. Jobs, once done by a team of manual laborers, can now be done by a fleet of mobile robots. It is not that humans are not needed anymore, but now so-called miners increasingly sit in comfortable offices above ground with windows that allow workers to enjoy natural sunlight and monitor operations of multiple machines from modern control stations. Computers distill data and present humans with only the most critical of decisions, allowing robotic vehicles to operate largely unsupervised, even during shift changes, or more importantly, during coffee breaks. Mining is not the only industry where the workplace is changing because of intelligent machines and mobile robots. In 2012, Amazon famously acquired a relatively small startup company called Kiva Systems for a whopping 775 million US dollars. Co-founded by a Canadian, Raf D'Andrea, who was a professor at Cornell at the time and who recently spoke here at Queen's, Kiva is now called Amazon Robotics and employs an entire fleet of warehouse robots that coordinate their motions in order to bring inventory shelves in real time to workers that pack orders, reducing fulfillment costs by as much as 40%. When you and millions of others click buy at amazon.ca, it is a robot that takes your order. There are of course other examples. Think agriculture, forestry, and military, to name a few. Never mind the fact that you can now buy a mobile robot to vacuum your carpets, cut your grass, and even assist you to drive safely along public highways. Your kids play with educational robots at school, learn to program, and compete on robot design teams that culminate in exciting competitions. Recent buzz created by uber-wealthy information technology companies, billionaire visionaries, and the media has people everywhere talking about self-driving cars. Although the forecasted panacea of completely autonomous transportation everywhere and anywhere may not become a reality for a little while yet, there is no doubt that the robots are coming. My name is Joshua Marshall and I am the recently appointed interim director of a new initiative at Queen's called the Institute for Disruptive Technologies. Supported by a generous multi-million dollar gift, we are an interdisciplinary research enterprise focused on the design and use of intelligent systems and robotic machines to enhance human productivity, creativity, safety, and quality of life. We are a team of researchers whose expertise spans a continuum, from artificial intelligence, machine learning, and human-machine systems to robotics, smart sensors, and mechatronic devices. This spring, we will set up shop in nearly 1,200 square meters of research space in the brand new Mitchell Hall. In this space and through the Institute for Disruptive Technologies, we will bring together researchers from across campus and around the world. But what's the big deal? Why now? As many of you are aware, the current boom in artificial intelligence and machine learning is largely due to the widespread availability of extremely fast computers and at the same time widespread access to reams and reams of data. Of course, at the forefront of exploiting all of this is a relatively small group of very large internet technology companies, particularly those who seek to prey on your personal interests, patterns of behavior, 
and tendencies in order to deliver, for example, targeted advertising and even sell information about you to other companies. But these uses are merely the low-hanging fruit. It is robotics and mechatronics that makes it possible for the algorithms of artificial intelligence to interact with us and the world around us. This is what our new institute at Queen's is about. As engineers and applied scientists, our job is to build safe and useful systems. We build future things. These systems are designed to advance society's needs and wants, not just sell you something based on analytics. Think smart homes and appliances that adapt and anticipate your needs, instrumented workspaces, buildings, bridges, and other infrastructure in human environments. Think tele-robots that support surgeons, allow for selective removal of cancers, or simply prevent mistakes. Think assistive devices and exoskeletons that help you recover from injuries more quickly, improve mobility, reduce workplace injuries, or maybe even replace missing limbs. Think autonomous vehicles that prevent industrial or public accidents, remove workers from harsh environments, deliver goods and services, monitor borders, tend to crops, fight forest fires, cut your grass and sweep your floors, clear the snow off an airport runway, or maybe even quickly clean the ice between periods at the hockey rink. So we all mostly agree, artificial intelligence and robotics are here to stay, and we have only scratched the surface of what may be possible. But are we as a society ready for all of this? A 2016 study by the World Economic Forum surveyed 15 major economies that collectively hold two-thirds of the global workforce, about 1.86 billion workers. They estimated that the rise of robots and artificial intelligence will destroy a net 5.1 million jobs by 2020. It is without question that artificial intelligence and robotics will not only replace jobs once held by humans, but also change the nature of jobs and therefore the future of work. The Queen's International Institute on Social Policy recently held its 23rd conference here in Kingston last August. This year's conference focused on the timely question, are Canadians ready for the future of work? Gabriela Ramos, Chief of Staff and G20 Sherpa of the OECD, during her opening keynote asked, how do we prepare the kids of the future for jobs when we don't know what kind of jobs there will be? And how many jobs will be transformed? Well, in his recent University Affairs article, Stephen Watt, Dean of the Faculty of Mathematics at the University of Waterloo said, I have seen firsthand the positive employment outcomes that await well-rounded students with good math and computing skills. Although I don't disagree with Dr. Watts, what I think we also need is a culture shift. I recently returned from more than a year of living abroad in Sweden, where I worked with an industrial vehicle manufacturer and a local university that has decided to make robotics and AI a major focus. What amazed me and humbled me most about my tenure in Sweden was my observation that they are already, both technically and culturally, ahead of us when it comes to being prepared for the digital future. Sweden boasts an impressive roster of homegrown companies that are decidedly modern. Think Ericsson, Volvo, Scania, Husqvarna, Ikea, H&M, Skype, Minecraft, to name only a few well-known examples. At the same time, their government has also invested heavily in digital technologies and infrastructure accessible to all. For instance, health records in Sweden are all digital. Go anywhere, doctor, dentist, pharmacy, and all you need is your ID number anywhere in the country Hard cash is now useless in Sweden. Even neighborhood garage sales and school bake sales won't take it. Not even public transit. They use Swish, which is sort of like PayPal or Interact e-transfer, but Swish is ubiquitous in Sweden. Nobody uses cash. And here's my favorite one. Every second house seemed to have a robot lawnmower. And although I don't have the numbers to back that up, I don't think that I'm exaggerating. These robots are everywhere, quietly cutting the grass, while nobody pays attention. Seriously though, a recent New York Times piece by Peter Goodman called, quote, the robots are coming and Sweden is fine, points to a stark contrast between Sweden's approach to social services and education and that of the United States when it comes to its role in preparing citizens for a future where AI and robotics change the future of work. Apparently Sweden is very ready and we in North America are not. Quote, in Sweden, if you ask a union leader, are you afraid of new technology, they will answer no, I'm afraid of old technology.
Let's go back underground for one last story. In the mid-2000s, I worked on the development of an autonomous vehicle system for underground mining vehicles that is now sold around the world. One of our first commercial deployments was in Chile. However, after less than a year with our automated vehicles, I was told that they canceled the project and went back to operator-driven machines. When I visited the mine to meet with the mine's manager, he told me that our technology was not the problem. They had indeed made productivity improvements and even reduced maintenance costs. But strangely, the scanning laser rangefinders that we had used on the vehicles for underground navigation kept breaking, but not by accident. Apparently, the mine's workers were smashing the equipment, suspicious of technology that might fundamentally change the nature of their work. I think Mr. Goodman, Dr. Watts, Ms. Ramos are all right. The robots are coming, whether we like it or not. The question is, will we be wise enough to not only exploit these new technologies for good, but at the same time protect? through our social safety net and public infrastructure and prepare by way of our education system for a future where the role of human workers in everyday jobs may be very different for our children than it has been for us. I personally believe that the future of work belongs to problem solvers. And thus, at the new Institute for Disruptive Technologies, although we may strive to build truly innovative and useful future things, it may be that our most important contribution will be in ensuring that our graduates possess the skills to not only leverage modern tools, but most importantly, to see solutions and designs that are not easily visible to the digital eye.